The fastest path to getting us off of fossil fuels and expanding our capability is fission power. We're trying to build a new reactor here, something that nobody's ever done before. But to me, it's actually just minimum viable product. We're building the smallest nuclear reactor. It's super hard. Scaling a company is challenging. This is a superpower to have on Earth. All of that has led to this moment. We're now, we're just 18 months away from having the real deal. So where are we and, and what does Radiant do? We're in El Segundo at Radiant's headquarters and we are designing a portable micro-reactor that can replace a one megawatt diesel generator and can be mass produced. Radiant is a company I've wanted to shoot with since I started filming the S3 series nearly 50 weeks ago. And finally, in El Segundo, California, we got the time to document where they're at today after their recent test success on their helium circulator test loop. Radiant is pioneering miniaturized mobile nuclear reactors to provide power in rough terrains and to re-inspire the atomic age. So nuclear has the highest energy density of any form of fuel that humanity has discovered and mastered. It's two million times the energy density of any hydrocarbon. You can have a huge amount of fuel and take up almost no mass. So I think nuclear power is essential to the long-term sustainability of the human species. I think there's really no path forward for power generation in human civilization that doesn't involve nuclear, whether that be fission or fusion. I really want either technology to succeed. And right now, I think the most practical one and the fastest path to getting us off of fossil fuels and expanding our capability is fission power. And in particular, portable fission power also enables a longer term civilization sustainability, which is something that Doug likes to talk about, which is space travel, right? And that's originally how we got into this in the first place. Uh, this is a, a superpower to have on Earth. If you want to you know, have cities at the bottoms of oceans, you could do that with the nuclear fuel. If you want to have power up on top of Mount Everest or in the Arctic, really anywhere on the Earth, this is the best form of fuel that there is if it's a challenge to get to that location. Um, you can think about space as just an extension, just a more remote and farther forward operating location. Over 55% of US soldier casualties in the two Iraqi conflicts are from ambushed convoys. And convoys move ammo, water, and fuel. And so if you could put a reactor in one of these locations, then you completely remove all those fuel shipments. You save tens of thousands of lives. Nuclear power saves lives. I don't think we hear that very often. Medical isotopes save way more lives than that. And uh, medical diagnostic imaging is probably the single greatest thing that nuclear power does, and, and people don't recognize it. It's natural that we need to be looking at nuclear technology, both on Earth in challenging locations and to save lives, but also in space. Typically, nuclear reactors are very large. Uh, you see like big gigawatt size things that massive undertaking, billions of dollars, many, many years for something to come to fruition. Uh, and, and that sort of has led to a stall in the nuclear industry of new reactors just because it takes so much upfront capital and then so much time to actually gain the reward from that project. Nuclear's a uh, story told in decades. So in the 60s, we developed everything. Nuclear reactors were made for submarines. In the 70s, we started to deploy power reactors based off of those uh, submarine reactors. In the 80s, we really had nuclear reach its peak scale in the US, but then we also had Chernobyl, a huge international disaster. And then in the 90s, you know, we had a turnaround where states banned nuclear. I think throughout all this, there was this growing uh, you know, environmental outrage and concern, and then uh, climate change, and then a eventually an acceptance of climate change. And I think we're now in the 2000s in this era where we have solar and we have wind and we have all these renewables uh, and everyone is excited about having a cleaner planet. And they've come back to recognize that that nuclear from 50 years ago is not the nuclear of today. We're trying to build a new reactor here, something that nobody's ever done before. A big part of our culture is to just iterate as quickly as possible. The only way to do that is to make a lot of reactors. That's sort of one of the big cornerstones of Radiant is to make small reactors, things that we can actually make quickly and make a lot of uh, and progressively make the design a lot better. Obviously, Radiant is developing Kaleidos, which is a portable nuclear reactor, which is meant to re replace diesel gensets. But to me, it's actually just minimum viable product. We're building the smallest nuclear reactor because uh, smaller is cheaper. It's super hard to do what we're doing right now, which is basically building our Falcon 1, but for a nuclear reactor. The reason why it's hard is because there's a ton of uh, regulatory hur hurdle uh, against it, uh, and we don't get to do it multiple times. We have to build this thing, and it's got to turn on. We have to go through a series of tests, 
And uh, by the time we're done, we need to have demonstrated several key characteristics uh, of the reactor. Simultaneously, that needs to align with our production unit, which is going to replace uh, diesel generators. So that, that's the challenge. Um, so I would say what Radiant is doing right now is actually developing the capability to design, produce, and build nuclear reactors. We know how to build nuclear reactors. The problem is that they tend to be really big, expensive, and difficult to construct. Radiant's solution to this problem is to miniaturize these reactors, demonstrating their safety step-by-step step, with the first reactor set to be turned on in 18 months. But before we talk about that, let's learn how a nuclear reactor works and how Radiance is a little different. How does a nuclear reactor work? There's two ways that nuclear reactors work. One is fusion and one is fission. Fusion is like the sun. That's where you take two atoms and you shove them together and it releases a lot of energy. Fission is the exact opposite. It takes one atom and it splits in half into two or more atoms. And that also releases a lot of energy. It also has a chain reaction to it because when you have that fission process, uh, to start it, it doesn't just fission on its own usually. You need to sort of excite it, and you do that by hitting it with a neutron. Uh, fission is uh, an atom ripping apart, and when, when that happens, the products are moving very fast, and they actually smash into their neighbors and just make heat through friction. So it's really funny, actually, that nuclear physics when you explain it in layman's terms, it all sounds like we're playing billiard balls, and that's sort of the truth. When something fissions, it will release a few neutrons in that process as well, and then those can go on and hit other atoms and cause them to fission as well. So in a nuclear reactor, you only really need two things, something that fissions, uh, it's like a fissile material, that's like uranium-235, uh, and then some way to slow neutrons down. You have fuel, which is, has uranium-235 in it. Ours has of almost 20% enrichment level. Uh, that is encapsulated in, in tiny little poppy seed sized particles called triso particle fuel. There's actually over 100 million of those tiny little particles of fuel in the core. And what happens is in our core, we have these control blades that move. And when those blades, they move away from the core, they actually connect the graphite reflector to the core and it goes critical. What I mean by critical is that uh, fission occurs, and enough fission occurs that every neutron uh, that comes out of that fission leads to one other fission, and the other neutrons are lost either due to absorption or leakage from the system. Neutrons only cause fissions typically when they're thermal, uh, so that's when they're in the slower energy range. So you want something that scatters neutrons well, but doesn't absorb them, something like carbon or water. And then when you want to make it actually practical, you need something to cool the reactor because you make a lot of heat, you need to get that heat out of there and move it to like a turbine eventually. A lot of big reactors will just use water for this as well, but we use helium. Helium doesn't become radioactive on its own. Uh, it has very little of a neutron cross-section, so neutrons don't interact with the helium at all. That's nice because there is you know, a hypothetical situation where you have an accident and you release your coolant to the atmosphere. If that happens to us, we're not releasing anything that's radioactive. So this is what we're working on. Uh, by 2028, we should be able to deliver one of these portable nuclear microreactors to a customer site and then ramp production as soon as possible up to 50 units a year. You can put uh, up to four megawatts, that's four Kaleidos reactors, inside of this shielding box, which is, it's just prefabricated concrete. Uh, and you need that so that you can use about a tennis court of space for four megawatts of power. Just outside that fence it is the NRC public dose limit. So you could have a sidewalk or a McDonald's or you name it right next to this. So here is a CAD model of the reactor barrel section of the pressure vessel with the upper dome taken off. And you can see in here the, the reflector ring or on the outside, that's where the control blades are that turn on and off the reactor. Inside the reactor core consists of these 37 fuel monoliths, which are made up of a reflector and then six fuel spacers and a lower reflector. Here we have a whole bunch of machined graphite. Graphite is a moderator in a nuclear reactor. You have to have fuel and you have moderator and the combination of those two things, you can slow down neutrons from a fission reaction and then create heat, which is what we use to then make power. So this is a big hunk of graphite. <laughs> uh, graphite is like what we make our core out of. Uh, so inside of each of these little channels here on the top, we would be putting fuel, and then the bigger holes are, they would put hydrides and then also coolant channels. Uh, so our coolant would flow through there to keep the rest of the system cold. But this was like a really big step for us because it was the first time we were comfortable enough in a core design that we could actually take the time to find somebody who could like try to cut it and actually start bringing it to life. Uh, and we learned a lot through the process too because you can see a lot of like mistakes here and imperfection, there's a big blowout over here, a chip through the top. and. We very quickly realized that nobody could drill channels long and straight like we needed them to, to do this design. So yeah, that, that was like a big move for the company to go through that iteration process of designing something, trying to build it, and then realizing that it had a lot of flaws and uh, having to sort of go back on it. 
So here's our helium test loop. The whole point of that test loop is to test the helium circulator, which is sitting right here right now. So this is the first prototype for uh, basically the heart of the helium loop, uh, which is the primary loop coolant. Helium is there to basically carry heat from the reactor and dump it into our power generation loop. So this is kind of the intermediary. The power generation loop converts heat into electricity. All of the complexity of that loop basically lives in the circulator. It's by far the most complex piece of the entire puzzle. This is the helium turbo pump. What this does is take helium and push it into the core. It goes up and cools the pressure vessel and then comes down and picks up heat from the core. It actually comes out at about 700 Celsius. It then goes through a heat exchanger, cools down and goes back into this machine. So there's a closed loop of helium. It's a foil bearing machine. It's designed for a lot of cycles and it's pretty bulletproof. We've been getting operational experience with it. We took it all the way up to 450 C, uh, which is its design temperature. It was right here a moment ago. It's undergoing an upgrade right now on a graphite foil bearing so that we can go up to full power on it. This is a lot bigger than what we're actually going to have in Kaleidos. The whole point was to test the helium circulator. And so we have a heater, we have some valves that let us play with the back pressure on the circulator so we can test the entirety of its operational map. And what we're doing is we are pretending like this pump is attached to the reactor. It doesn't really know, but uh, it thinks it's attached to a reactor <laughs> so that we understand everything about the pump before we put nuclear fuel in our system. This will go in a Kaleido system, but all the rest of this is just for test, for convenience. Uh, we left it actually on the weld stands, so when it heats up, it grows and it rolls on those wheels. Uh, this is Radiance Method. We take our hardware, we test it in the envelope we expect to use, and then we go a little bit outside that envelope in the test scenario, and then we put that into code, and then we run a digital twin of a reactor to develop our control systems. We've built a systems model of the entire nuclear reactor. So this covers all of the different aspects of the system that we want to be able to capture about its performance, about its characteristics, and about its safety. And so what we're showing on the screen here is a model of the reactor's performance running in real time. It has internal temperatures of the reactor itself shown, as well as different cross sections of the temperatures inside the reactor of the height of it. And then along here, we show the current uh, state of the nuclear reaction, the state of the heat coming out of the reactor system, and then the state of the cooling motor that is moving helium through the reactor. So one of the interesting things we can do with this system is we can introduce system failures where we can cause the heat sink, which is the primary motor that pushes helium through the reactor to fail as well. So we click a button here, it commands it to go into a failed state, and then we'll see the uh, the mass flow of the pump drop to zero, and the reactors start to heat up as a result. Um, once it does this, it triggers a fault condition, and the reactor starts trying to safe itself. And you see that here with the control surfaces of the reactor rotating inward to turn it off. It allows us to capture the dynamics of the system, estimate the performance of the system, and estimate the safety of the system. So we will use this in the future to drive our hardware in the loop testing, where we have all of the sensors about uh, that would be actually on the reactor system, and the control computer that's actually running on the reactor system, running our real control software, running through different emergency scenarios and showing how our control software responds with this simulator producing faked sensor values to the software so it thinks it's driving a real reactor. Planning to get there about halfway through this year, and then start doing integrated testing with the final reactor controls. Next big milestone is what we call the passive cooldown test. There won't be any nuclear fuel, it'll just be electrically heated, uh, but it's a, a big undertaking for us because it, it's going to look like a nuclear reactor would. We're assembling a full core worth of graphite, the pressure vessel for the reactor system, and integrating our cooling loop demonstration into that system, so actually cooling a reactor core with our passive cooling air jacket, as we call it, around the outside. So this is our air jacket flow test. Um, this enables us to get the science to prove exactly how much heat will be able to reject passively from the pressure vessel. If there's any kind of accident scenario with the reactor, that airspace opens and then cold air comes in, picks up some heat and rejects it to the environment. The fuel stays cold, the pressure vessel stays cold, and the reactor safely shuts down. And basically this enables us to get a set of correlations, which we can then put into our digital twin models, exactly predict how much heat will be um, rejected to the environment. The idea here is that we can demonstrate the shutdown profile of the reactor system in the case of an emergency and show that as the nuclear fuel continues to produce heat, that we remain 
passively safe. We'll go through the entire assembly process, work out how we're going to do machining and all of the assembly of, of, of all of the parts in there, and then actually get you know the experience doing that. And we're learning a lot about uh, about the design through that process. So when we get to Idaho National Lab, we want to do a fuel test of the first reactor in 50 years in the beginning of 2026. Uh, that is only about 18 months away right now. So we have to test everything that we can so that fuel is the only variable left when we're at the lab. So we got a building that's nine times bigger. We had an old crane that was one ton. This is a 10 ton crane. So it's just the crane this right size for this building. Um, is it? It's, 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 almost, it's almost touching the roof. <laughs> it's almost too big, but that's how we like it. Uh, uh, it's actually lined up with this door right here, uh, which is a custom door. We actually knocked out the wall, and we have a 14-foot reactor-sized door. So we'll build the reactor right here using this crane, assemble it along with all the shielding, and with no fuel in it, it will ship out this door and go to Idaho National Lab. It's been years in the making. We started in 2020, uh, and I left SpaceX where I had been for 12 years and I didn't, hadn't run a company before, never really intended to. And I feel like we have to build a nuclear technology company just because it's required for space and it's required for Earth. And no one's mass produced it before. Learning how to build teams and to lobby and to talk to investors and to do the actual design work. Back in 2020, I would have told myself, go and lobby, don't try to build something. Um, and then have that proof that you can build, uh, drive things. Just go and talk to people way ahead of it. I would say hype more. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Scaling a company is challenging. Getting people aligned and working on the same thing together is, is fundamentally difficult. Um, and hiring is fundamentally difficult. All of that has led to this moment where now we're just 18 months away from having the real deal. This was a very special episode for me to film. I've been wanting to shoot with Radiant for so long and Doug showed me so many interesting things while filming, like the United States entire reserve of nuclear grade graphite their very scrappy cooling tub, and a crane that's just barely the right size. I actually think that crane is a great representation of where Radiant is at. The crane, like their vision, is almost too big for where they are, but these are experienced engineers and builders with a clear plan to turn on their first reactor in 18 months. And after getting to capture where Radiant is at today, I think they and their crane will be ready when the time comes in 18 months to go critical.